Hello again. The Practical Animal Channel is dedicated to the public understanding of conservation by interviewing vets, ecologists and reserve managers to provide the information students need. Besides ideas for animal projects, you'll find out what to wear for an interview and good questions to ask. Today's guest is an expert on bird of prey rehabilitation. Sean Bannister, as a child, had plenty of birds that were brought to him to be rescued. He researched how to train hawks using falconry techniques. Eventually, he was lucky enough to meet a falconer who became his mentor. After many years of flying and training many species of raptor, he began to specialise in the flying of falcons, peregrines in particular. People began to seek his advice and guidance, including the police rural crime teams, and he began to receive peregrines and other species that required falconry techniques to ensure their successful return to the wild. He found it very satisfying to be able to modify and adjust falconry basics in order to achieve fit, strong, confident peregrines ready to return to their environment. If studying birds of prey interests you, then watch to the end for project ideas around their rehabilitation. Please consider subscribing. Bird of prey rehabilitation is most certainly not for the squeamish, and neither is this video. centres advertise their conservation through rehabilitation of birds of prey. What outcomes would you like to see from such centres? There are very few centres that actually offer that. There are plenty of rescue centres. They're rescuing hedgehogs, storks, crows, pigeons, seagulls, and happen to come across raptors. So my first action on that would be that they don't go to those centres, that they go to specific raptor centres, because the outcome, generally speaking, is not very good. They're not specialists. They don't really understand what's required of the raptors. They really do mean, well, owls are raptors, uh, and yet you can quite comfortably manage an owl in a rescue centre of any type, really, if you've got basic understanding of what owls require, because they're not in any way demanding of the rescuer. When it comes to normal diurnal raptors, uh, then they really do need uh, people who deal with diurnal raptors on a daily basis. And unfortunately, they go to these centres. The initial treatment is rarely good. The initial setup is rarely good. So instead of setting the bird up in a falconry arrangement with equipment, uh, the correct perching equipment, or even the correct type of pen initially, uh, while they do an assessment, they invariably don't, and they put them into the wrong type of pen, uh, cause far more damage, tend not to realise that this damage is, is life-threatening to the bird. And if it had any chance before that, it's pretty much not going to have much chance after it. Uh, and I'm talking about feather damage primarily. And then they release the bird to a round of applause, and everybody's very happy, and it looks great, and the bird flies off over the hedgerow to die. But it isn't always inevitable. There's always a chance with a raptor. As a friend of mine recently just found out when he lost some 20-odd GA falcons and he managed to recover a, a number very quickly. Uh, and then some months down the line, he was still recovering GA falcons that had managed to survive and look after themselves and were killing quite successfully in the wild. They were lost from a hack pen. So when they were lost from a hack pen, they were already fitter than your normal injured wild bird that comes in. And a wild bird that's never been in the wild, i.e. one that's come from a nest, for example, a rescue, they've got no chance. I often say this to the American, they, they fly passage birds. Passage bird is a bird that hasn't quite reached its first molt, but it has been brought up in the wild completely. It knows how to kill, it knows how to fly, it's fit, strong, it knows how to use the air to its advantage. And then it's trapped by the falconer, tamed down, trained very quickly, and then it goes back to its business of, of flying. And passengers are 
particularly easy to deal with. I find dealing with passengers, because I deal with them all the time as rescues, uh, amazingly easy to deal with. They so responsibly, so quickly, that I've actually looked at them and thought they've been trained before. I've had hobbies in, I've had sparrow hawks, peregrines that were jumping to the fish within a day. So when you compare that to uh, the British uh, system, which is we've never had passengers anyway, unless they were imported from Holland, but we always had ice birds. And if we took an ice bird, we had to then... Or we have to first of all train that bird to respond, and they tend to be because they're normally reared in captive breeding in enclosed pens. When they come out of there, they tend to be scared to death of everything. They've had no time to acclimatize to any sort of uh, visual stimulus, and obviously, uh, a bird of prey in particular is primarily oriented to being visually stimulated. Uh, they come out of a closed pen. They've never seen anything before. They're scared to death. They're scattered as a biscuit, and they take some control and some getting used to and various methods we can use to do that. Uh, whereas a passage bird or even a, a wild iris bird has often uh, been watching uh, mankind, traffic, uh, animals, people, dogs, cats, rabbits, whatever, for the duration of its life. And then it comes into captivity. It's already seen these things. It's already to a degree, although at distance, uh, become used to some of those aspects. And I find that, again, when I pick up wild iris birds that have, that have fallen from nests or jumpers, as we call them, they man down very quickly compared to a captive bread bird. So when we get a captive bread bird, we, we not only have to train it, let it acclimatize itself and overcome those fears, those initial fears, uh, but we then have to get it flying. We have to teach it how to fly. We have to teach it the benefits of height. We have to then teach it some footing skills and the ability to catch quarry from various positions. Uh, we have to keep it fit or get it fit, although first year birds are, are, are amazingly fit for the first year for in their first year. And then we have to uh, wrap all that up into a, into a single package and keep control of the bird while we're doing so. So we set ourselves quite an onerous task. Now, if it takes a falconer a good season to get his bird doing that. Yeah, and it can be out every day for the whole duration of a season. Uh, well, what chance does that bird have if, if it's just let loose from the pen just because it's got the right amount of feathers on? Um, and you let it go and it'll just fly off into the horizon and die 99% of the time. Back to the original focus of your question was, what would I advise that these centres do is, is that if they're not raptor oriented and they haven't got a specialist in them, then they need to pass the birds on to somebody who is and who knows what to do. I have a friend who runs an owl sanctuary, and I use the word sanctuary because she, she takes in lots of rescued owls. Whenever she gets a diurnal raptor, she just phones me up and says, Sean, I've got a sparrow or goss or peregrine kestrel, what can I do with it? She's the perfect example, really, because she knows that she's out of her depth and she's quite happy to admit that, uh, but she's not afraid to reach out and, and get proper help. Uh, and it, it's extremely frustrating when well-meaning people and centres and charities um, take on raptors. They then post up publicly, and I've seen, well, in fact, uh, as I was just mentioning to you earlier on, I was engaged in the conversation because as soon as they come up in my region, everybody starts pinging me straight away uh, to 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 get on board and take some information and find out what I can do about it. Uh, and I've seen endless amounts of well-meaning charities, well-meaning uh, rescue centres, and I keep using inverted commas, um, that take on a plethora of birds and they'll put up pictures of their their new pet buzzard where they've got them tickling it behind the ears and before you know it it's a disaster waiting to happen and they mean well and if you go on board god forbid you actually go onto the site and say to them hey look you're not you don't really want to be doing that that's not the way to to deal with a, a young sparrow hawk, for instance because you're going to imprint it and then you're really going to struggle to get it back. Once you mention that kind of thing, you then become the enemy. And everybody who knows nothing about birds but is amazingly good at uh, thropomizing them, so they turn everything into a human reflex and oh, the bird's feelings are paramount, irrespective of the realities of life. Yeah, I'm very guarded about dealing with those kind of folk. John, what has been the contribution of falconers to raptor conservation? I think that's pretty much... Uh, written down in history now with the, with the likes of people like Tom Cade with the Peregrine Fund, the recovery of the uh, Madagascan Kestrel, the uh, Californian Condor. Well, certainly in the case of the Californian Condor with the imprinting techniques and the use of handheld puppets for feeding uh, and the rearing of the youngsters. I think most of it goes back to uh, pre-DDT or when DDT was still in place and Tom Cade and everybody became aware that the, uh, the Peregrine in America was pretty much going to be extinct. 
uh, certainly on the eastern seaboard. Uh, so then they got all the falconers in America that had peregrines and they pulled them all, all together. Uh, they got them breeding. They had fantastic breeding programs. They experimented and practiced and uh, figured out different ways of hacking birds back, whether it was a tame hack, a wild hack, whether it was placing youngsters into safe sites. Two years ago, it's come off the blue list. It's come off the threatened list now. The goshawk in Britain wouldn't exist, really, without falconers losing them on a regular basis. The, the goshawk population is relatively stable in the UK. Why is raptor rehabilitation? important it's important that we get a bird back to the wild uh, as soon as possible and as able and capable of surviving as soon as possible that boils down to the fact that i care it is the acceptable face of falconry to a very anti-blood sport public birds go out and they have to kill things to be successful i think it's an acceptable face of of a sport and an art form which is falconry because i don't consider falconry to be just a sport we are now in we live in a, a society where the public are very aware of nature the general public are engaged so find that the sport of falconry where you would get a trained raptor to go out and kill quarry in an actual environment is obscene because they think we're doing it for entertainment uh, and i don't see it as entertainment i think there's a couple of things that you have to accept first of all when it comes to falconry is that first of all you have to accept that in life, to survive, something dies. Uh, and that's in all aspects of life. The only aspect of falconry I enjoy, really, the, the main aspect of falconry I enjoy, is that I get to bear witness to it. That, that's all. I'm just in a symbiotic relationship with the raptor, and I get to bear witness to watch them doing what they can do that most people don't get to see. The main thing about in terms of uh, falconry and what does it bring to rehabilitation is that it allows us, using those techniques that have been honed over what, four or 5,000 years, certainly over 4,000 years, using those techniques, fine-tuning them, using the modern-day techniques like GPS, and we can monitor and watch the progress of the bird as it develops mentally until it becomes a self-actualized raptor. You know, a buzzard is quite easy to do a rehab with a buzzard. Uh, you just get the bird flying back into the year. It understands what it needs to do. And because of the nature of its hunting, which is basically a scavenge grab opportunistic hunter then uh, yeah, as long as it's fitting for fly then it can go you know it's not going to go far it's not going to be under a lot of pressure at the very worst you can just go behind the tractor and pick up the, the snails and the slugs and the worms as a sparrow walks a different matter again because they rely on massive bursts of speed etc so they've got to be fit ultimate techniques in raptor rehabilitation guarantee that you can to a degree monitor control and create the opportunities to get the bird back to his fit state in order for it to return to the world and have a reasonable chance of survival. Globally, are there any jobs in raptor rehabilitation? You know, if if, if you had that expertise, you could take it over into a job uh, quite easily. Mm. But yeah, there's no there's no there's nobody making any money out of it. So Sean, if a bird of prey centre receives a hawk for rehabilitation, what are five essentials? that you'd like to see the centre provide? First of all, uh, that decision has to be made by a vet, whether it's suitable for rehabilitation. And Ideally, that would be an avian vet. Then the decision making needs to be made as to what kind of rehabilitation is going to take place, because there are lots of kinds of rehabilitation. There are uh, disabled rare species that it's never going to go back. The first decision that really needs to be made is if the bird is able to go back, that's one thing. If it's not able to go back, are we going to hold on to that bird for conservation reasons or are we going to put it to sleep for quality of life reasons? Does it need to uh, be trained and released back to the wild? And that's pretty much species dependent. A sedentary hunting species scavenger like a buzzard is a different uh, question than a parent or a hobby or a kestrel. Is it a youngster that can go into a foster home and be fostered before it goes back to the wild. So what are we at? Decision on the treatment. We then need to look at if we're going to go into a falcon re rehabilitation, the person that's taking it on is capable and experienced at that. It's no good giving a peregrine to to a guy who flies sparrowhawks uh, and vice versa. If the bird is, is disabled being, but being kept for conservation reasons, then it needs to go into the right quarters and it needs to have some ambition to the, towards its future. Uh, you need to have the facilities somewhere they don't necessarily have to be at the location where you can get these birds returned to the wild now whether if it's been done with falconry purposes that's fine because you can just go out and fly them where, where you normally fly but if it's being done from a hack situation 
uh, either a wild hack or a tame hack, then you need a location suitable for doing that. John, what skills does a person need to take on raptor rehabilitation? That is very much species dependent. Let's say, let's say we got a guy who's, who's flown Harris Hawks for a while, or Red Till perhaps, um, then they should really have no problem with taking on a buzzard and, and getting it to a suitable level of fitness and being able to hack that bird back to the wild. Yeah, they've got to, be, they've got to have experience with that species. And if not, then they need somebody with them that's got that experience. You are a recognised raptor rehabilitator. What does that mean? Who's recognised you? Police. And they said, would you mind advising us on bird to prey situations that we come across in the area? Because we are the rural crime team. And I said, by all means. John, where do our knowledge gaps lie regarding bird of prey rehabilitation? It's all about a cost factor. Post rehab is the area where we lack the data. Can you suggest a project for a student who is watching this who wants to do a project on bird of prey rehabilitation? It would be mainly gathered on information from rehabilitators, but post rehabilitation data, collating that would be interesting. Rehabilitators, if they're honest, uh, wouldn't be honest, wouldn't be as honest as perhaps they should be because they want their rehabilitation to be a success. And they're not always a success. Birds die. It doesn't always work. We're just hoping to improve the chances. So that's something they'd have to factor into the conversations. But yeah, gathering that information up would be really useful. Or even just doing a study on a particular, a particular bird and following it through from start to finish and seeing what the outcomes are and seeing what worked and what didn't work. Somebody watching this who wants to get into bird of prey rehabilitation what advice can you offer them please go do your foundation work you've got to have a foundation in raptors so go and volunteer at a center there seems to be a modern day trait god knows why where people don't want to do apprenticeships they just want to be the thing straight away the one great level about falcon is that it's always an apprenticeship they've got to understand uh you know basic handling of birds care and husbandry uh, and they can learn that in the center for free basically for just a bit of mucking out and doing an apprenticeship um, or tagging along with a falconer. I mean, that's the best way if you can. There's also a modern day curse of short term enthusiasm. Falconry can be a grinder with it to, to get any good, to get any level. You've got to be a, a little bit obsessive about it to be, to be good. Yeah, you've got to be a bit selfish and a bit obsessive. Don't expect it overnight. John, you're a falconer and a recognized raptor rehabilitator. Thank you so much for being on the Practical Animal Channel, Sean Bannister. Thank you very much.